Okay. Um, this next this next chapter, uh, chapter five, uh, in your book, page uh, sixty-four. My turn there. Um, goes over uh, some of the aspects of mowing, which is what you do all the time. This is probably your your uh, main uh, job that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, can we have the light back just this one right here? There you go. Thanks. Um, there's a few things we're just going to go over, and th this is nothing new to any of you. Uh, we're just going to go over uh, just the general aspects of mowing, some of the things to be thinking about, and a few changes that we're suggesting, you know, that, that, that you try out, okay? Uh, I think it'll make it easier for you, more efficient for you, and actually do a better job as far as just a few changes in equipment, basically. Um, okay, again, what is mowing? Again, we start out with what is what, uh, and it's simply mowing grass, you know, cutting grass, cutting, cutting basically uh, ground cover. It's not necessarily grass. Uh, what you're doing, too, oftentimes, is taking care of weeds uh, because that's one of the easiest way to keep down weed infestation is to, to mow uh, on a regular basis. So you're mowing what's ever there. If it's green, mow it, right? Uh, whether it's weeds, grass, or whatever. Uh, and it's the most uh, common thing uh, that you do uh, on roadside maintenance is mowing. Every two weeks, basically, is the schedule. At the same time, of course, then you're doing the rubbish control and that kind of thing too. Oh, by the way, as pointed out, we're wrong on calling a ditch a ditch and a swale a swale. Yeah, it's the other way around. You guys all knew that, right? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we we need to correct that. So the swale is the concrete lined one, and the ditch is the the larger one that collects the water. Okay, it's a matter of naming. They do the same thing, you know, but there's we've got them mixed up. Sorry about that. Um, Okay, um, when you mow, what, you know, how does grass respond to that? Well, good turf grass responds really well. Uh, good turf grass will actually thrive uh, on a regular mowing schedule. There's lots, uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of different species of grasses, uh, technically grasses, uh, anywhere from bamboo, which is technically a, a type of a grass, uh, hay and all kinds of things. Uh, down to the kinds of grasses that can be mowed on a regular basis and do well, those are the kinds of grasses that we call turf grass. So turf grasses are the ones that we would like to see used uh, uh, in, in landscape because they can be mowed on a regular basis and they do very well. Usually when these, gr these uh, turf grasses are mowed on a regular uh, basis, the uh, runners, which all of our uh, uh, warm season grasses are here in Hawaii, things like Bermuda, Zoysia, Paspalum, they all spread by putting out runners, right? These above ground runners uh, where little uh, plantlets come out and they root, or they have underground runners. The, the above ground runners are called stolons, and the underground runners are called rhizomes. All of our warm season grasses, that's the way they spread, not by seed. Most of our warm season grasses don't form, don't uh, uh, make a seed that germinates. They can form seed heads, but that's not how they grow and spread. So as a result of mowing, these runners, especially the above ground runners, the stolons, tend to tack down closer to the, to the ground and root down and spread out quicker. So it actually results in a denser lawn uh, if you mow on a regular basis. Um, without mowing, inevitably what happens is that weeds begin to come in of various sorts. And over a period of time, if you don't mow at all, uh, everything comes in that's, that's in that area. If it's along the roadside in a rainforest and so forth, all kinds of things can come in uh, from seed mostly or from other kinds of little uh, vegetative uh, plantlets and so forth. And very quickly, that area uh, can what we call uh, uh, naturalize, meaning that Everything around there is going to come in and start go growing, and you no longer have a ground cover. You no longer have uh, anything that you can even mow. You know, very quickly you've got trees and shrubs and all kinds, vines and all kinds of things. Sometimes that's okay. Sometimes that's what we want on slopes and so forth. But if you don't want that to happen, then mowing is the best way to prevent 
those kinds of situations from developing. Just mow it every two weeks. Um, so that's 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 the you know uh, black and white of mowing. If you if you don't want the weeds there, if you don't want the area to naturalize, then mow. Uh, now, most of the grasses uh, along the roadside are not one of these, what we call, warm season turf grasses. Uh, if we have anything, it's probably a lot of Bermuda grass, uh, common Bermuda grass. But most of what's on the roadside is weedy species, right? Uh, whatever that might be. I don't know, it's a combination of a lot of different things. And here again, it's the, it's the thing, if it's green, mow it. You know, and fine, it looks okay. Uh, and for most purposes, that's, that's, that works. However, there, there may be, and more and more as we build new highways that improve uh, entrances like along Nimitz Highway for APEC, we put in uh, you know, all of that new stuff, uh, St. Augustine. Uh, there are more and more areas now, especially in high visible areas, uh, that are using really good uh, warm season grasses. Uh, a lot of it is St. Augustine uh, down, down the Pali. That's what they used on Nimitz Highway, St. Augustine, very commonly used. But anyone, uh, uh, the other four here uh, do grow very well in Hawaii. Uh, one other one that's used mostly for homeowners is centipede grass, which is a great grass too, but not really uh, that adapted to the roadside. It doesn't wear very well. Um, it, it'll, with any kind of wear, uh, tra foot traffic or whatever, uh, it, it uh, dies out. So these are the four main ones that might be used. Probably the two most used would be Bermuda grass and St. Augustine. Here. St. Augustine. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Why would I have in my yard? Well, there's well, there's other kinds of, of, of well, Kukui grass uh, would be one that's kind of a weedier. It's a turf grass. You can mow it, but it's a it's a it's. A, well, that that could be. St. Augustine, yeah. But there's other ones that, that are, uh, like helo grass, is really wide bladed too, right? Uh, the difference between helo grass and St. Augustine is that uh, St. Augustine grows by the long runners, come in big, thick, almost not quite the size of your finger. That's St. Augustine. Um, helo grass has the big, thick leaves, but it grows more in whorls, you know? So when you mow it, you see these little circles of grass, yeah. K um, uh, uh, kakui grass. Is a good grass. It's a good cover grass, and would be okay really for roadside. But it's really invasive. It grows everywhere. It goes up over fences and all kinds of things. So it's not the best thing to be using along the roadside because it does spread uh, really, really fast. So these are the main ones really for a homeowner resort, high-end roadside. These are the ones that would be used, but mostly Bermuda and St. Augustine. So we want to talk. If you do have these, or come in contact, if you're home or whatever, you have maybe, uh, you private contractors deal with this. If you have resort and high-end uh, homes and so forth, uh, you come in contact with these kinds of uh, grasses, I would suppose, quite a lot. So we want to talk a little bit about each, just briefly, uh, as far as maintenance is concerned. Uh, first one, Bermuda grass. Um, the, um, there's, there's actually two general kinds of Bermuda grass. There's one, the old common Bermuda grass that's been around for 50 years. Uh, we used to call Manini, uh, and that's the only thing we had, you know, was the old Manini. It worked good. It was, it was work, uh, used during World War II as, as, as airplane runways. You know, it was really a good ground cover. It held up really well. Um, so um, that's one type that, uh, and the uh, common Bermuda grass can grow from seed. There, there is viable seed. Now, in the last 30 or 40 years, maybe the last 20 years, uh, they've really improved that common Bermuda grass seed. They, they, they have a lot of different forms of the common Bermuda grass, probably maybe 50 now. And those are really, really a lot better than the old common Manini. Uh, they, they look a lot more like the Hydra Bermuda, like uh, TIF, TIF 419 and some of those. But they can still be grown by seed. One of the better ones uh, out there now is called uh, Princess X77. Uh, there's another one called Blue Muta. There's, there's quite a few out there. So that probably for roadside use would, would be a really good choice uh, if you're going to be planting uh, kind of a high-end grass. Um, some of the uh, hybrid types, 
don't, they, they do form seed heads, but the seed isn't viable, it doesn't sprout. Uh, so you have to plant the hybrids by some type of vegetative part of the grass, usually a runner. You chop up runners and, and plant them out. It's called stolonizing. Uh, that's, that's the um, most common way for um, uh, planting any kind of hybrid Bermuda. TIF 419 uh, is probably one of the more common Bermuda grasses used here uh, for sports fields, especially uh, football fields, soccer fields, baseball fields, because it holds up really well. It grows fast and it holds up really well. Uh, it, if it does, does get worn down, it grows so fast, it'll recover you know, very quickly. Um, so this is very, very heavily used in resort areas and so forth uh, in sports fields. Uh, as far as taking care of Bermuda grass, maintaining it, uh, for mowing it, uh, common Bermuda grass can be mowed at a fairly high uh, rate, uh, inch and a half, maybe even two inches, uh, and it does okay. Some of these newer ones are better off if you mow it a little bit lower than that, say at an inch to an inch and a half. Um, and um, it's, it's better, all of these things are better mowed, not trimmed, but better, better mowed with a, with a rotary mower or a reel mower, not a weed, weed, not a weed eater. Uh, so, so some people, you know, uh, can do a fairly good job with a weed eater, I know that. But there's always, you can always tell the difference. It's, it's, it's much better for the grass using a mower than a weed eater. Uh, weed eaters tend to chop, break the grass off. And, and it tends to turn brown. You can see scalp marks and so forth. Um, but it's, there is a place for weed eaters to do that. But with Bermuda and all these other ones, using a, uh, uh, a uh, say, a, even a 21-inch push mower, you know, rotary mower, uh, or self-propelled, is a much better deal if you can use it. Now, there are areas that are meant uh, that you can't get to with a mower, like around the edge, bottom of signs and so forth, where trimming uh, is necessary with the weed eater. We'll talk more about that. Um, so mowing uh, at, at an inch and a half or so uh, with the common Bermuda. If, if you're using any of the hybrid Bermudas, it's, it's better to mow them below an inch. And you have to use a real mower for that. Uh, rotary mowers can't be set lower than one inch. Uh, uh, some, some newer ones can go down a little bit, but you really have to have a nice flat surface to do that. So if you're going to be mowing at, at, at lower mowing heights, you, you need to use a reel mower. Golf courses, for example, all of their, all of their cuts are using reel mowers, whether it's a, 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 yeah, the, like this kind, you know. Uh, and uh, even the fairways, you know, are cut with reel mowers because they're cutting that, and most of that's Bermuda, because they're cutting it like a, a half an inch, three quarters of an inch. So um, not practical for roadside, of course. You know, you're not going to be out there with a the real mower on the roadsides. So uh, if we're going to use Bermuda, probably a uh, improved common Bermuda. Uh, some of the good things about Bermuda, there's a lot of good uh, weed killers out there that can control weeds uh, that, that won't, uh, they're selective uh, herbicides that won't injure the Bermuda grass, both for weedy grasses and for broadleaf grasses. So weeds are really pretty easily controlled. Um, Watering uh, should be done uh, on an infrequent basis, maybe twice to three times a week, uh, but really soak it good every time you water. That's true of any of these grasses. Don't water a little bit every day. Water, really soak it well down. The ideal uh, irrigation cycle should, should soak the, the soil down about 12 inches. Uh, and then in about two or three days, there's plenty of water down there, reservoir, for over two or three days then for that to be used up and not run out. Uh, if you water for five minutes a day, you're only getting water down maybe that far into the soil, and that's where the roots stay. So you got, and you have to water every day or it dries out. Right? So uh, deep watering uh, is recommended. One, one not so good thing about uh, uh, Bermuda is that it does require a lot of fertilizer. Um, in resorts and so forth, uh, if they're using even the um, uh, slow-release nitrogen fertilizers, they're, they're probably fertilizing four times a year, quarterly, at least. On, that's the fairways. On the greens, they're much, much more frequently on the greens. Golf greens are a special thing. You don't, that's the most pampered part of the earth is, is a golf green, you know, because it's made completely out of sand. You know, it's all sand. So don't try to put a golf green in your front yard, you know, unless you want to 
put about four, four, a layer of four, four feet of sand underneath there. Uh, otherwise, it, it, it just, they won't survive. Uh, so anyway, lots of fertilizers. Now, we said one to two times a year. That would be on a roadside situation. If we do fertilize uh, using regular fertilizers, uh, we talked about fertilizing yesterday. If we can get that really ultra slow stuff, once a year would be fine. Uh, one thing, good or bad, uh, it does need full sun. Any shade at all will set any kind of Bermuda back. Uh, it thins out. It just doesn't do well in any kind of shade. So full sun all day long uh, is the best for Bermuda. Uh, very excellent foot traffic, and it grows fast. So therefore, it's a, it's a great uh, kind of ground cover, great kind of turf grass for areas that take a lot of foot, like golf courses and football fields and baseball fields, uh, soccer fields and things like that. So probably if we're going to be using Bermuda on the roadsides in, in the future more, it would be the improved common seeded type, which have the advantage you can, uh, you can hydromulch, which is a lot easy, more easily planted. Um, a little bit of El Toro actually here on Oahu is being used uh, out toward Pearl City. Uh, on the slopes uh, right, right before you get to exit 10, all along there, it's an experimental patch. Maybe some of you are familiar with that. That's El Toro. Used to be, anyway. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is now. Um, because here again, it's, it's really hard, uh, if you're just mowing it, to keep every other kinds of grasses out. So it looks great still from a distance. It looks great. Um, so a little bit of El Toro zoysia is being used. There's other zoysias available. Um, emerald uh, is the, the old pokey grass. The old, very, very common for long grasses. Not, not at all suited for roadside. Gets too thatchy. Um, here again, that's, uh, it's a hybrid, uh, meaning that uh, it won't form viable seeds. So uh, zoysias are normally planted either from little plugs of sod, uh, like one foot on, on center, or you can actually shred the sod up, rake it all up and plant it that way. That's the way the sod farmers plant it is breaking it all up into little tiny pieces, spreading that out, because that's the, each little piece has four or five or six uh, little stolons that are all rooted, you know, ready to go. All you need to do is, is cover it over a little bit and water it, and very quickly it'll root, and you've got a new lawn. Um, El Toro can be uh, mowed, and probably is better mowed, uh, above an inch, so you can use a rotary mower with it. Uh, you don't have to use a reel mower. It can be mowed below an inch, too, uh, for homeowners and so forth. Uh, between three quarters and, say, an inch and a half would be its maximum range. So it does look really good with a reel-type mower uh, in, in high-end places, resorts or whatever. Matter of fact, there's some uh, right out here uh, next to the office next door, El Toro, on the, on the left-hand side of the driveway. You might take a look. Uh, a really, really, really nice, thick uh, uh, type of lawn, um, but probably not that well suited for roadside. Um, fairly easily uh, uh, weed control. There's a lot of different herbicides again uh, that will that will control grassy weeds and, and broadleaf weeds out there um, and not injure uh, the uh, 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 zoysia. Uh, uh, Joe mentioned the other day, actually Roundup at at a reduced strength, and not Roundup, Fusillate at a reduced strength uh, will not, uh, not kill, at least, uh, the uh, zoysia. If you have Bermuda, for example, in zoysia, uh, you, can, you can, over a period of time, uh, treat it with a, a, a uh, lesser concentration of Fusillate and set back the Bermuda without, with, without killing the zoysia. But be careful, because if you, you get it, mix it too strong, uh, then it, uh, it'll kill everything. Um, so normally fusillade is an example of a, a grass killer, uh, not broadleaf. Um, again, watering uh, every, every twice a week maybe, but watering well each time if there's irrigation there. Um, if there's not irrigation uh, and it, it's, uh, it's not really that drought tolerant, Bermuda is pretty drought tolerant. It can go back and go bare and nothing there, and it'll come back from the underground rhizomes eventually. Uh, not zoysia as much. Even though it does have the underground runners, it's not as drought tolerant as Bermuda. 
So if you, if you have this out like along the roadside here, that's irrigated, right? Out here uh, on the uh, coming exit 10 coming in on H1. That's where that zoysia is. I'm pretty sure I see irrigation. I don't know if it works or not anymore. But yeah, there was irrigation there at one time. Um, and it looks like it is, it, it is irrigated. Um, fertilize again, doesn't take as much. Fertilizing uh, on a roadside basis would be once a year. Uh, on an, on a, a high-end uh, home or whatever, maybe twice a year using the slow release stuff. Uh, but if you can get the ultra slow, anything is one year. Um, it, it does uh, tolerate some shade. That's one of the advantages of zoysia over Bermuda. It'll take some shade, maybe up to 30, 40 uh, percent, especially if it's shaded from trees and so forth where parts in full sun and then it moves over and then uh, shade during the evening or whatever. Uh, no, uh, no grass will do very well if it's, if it's modeled sun all, all day long. You know, that's even though it's 50 percent shade, uh, it does better if it gets some full sun. Um, again, very wear resistant. It's more wear resistant than Bermuda. It takes a lot to really uh, wear down any kind of zoysia. But the difference is that it has a, a, a slower growth rate. So it takes longer to recover. That's why they don't use it so much on sports fields. Because it will hold up really well, but once it wears down, it takes a long time to come back. And oftentimes that's, that's not a good situation, say, on a football field. You have to keep it going, you know. Um, but it's, uh, more, it's being more, used more and more and more now for home lots. Uh, St. Augustine, this is the one that's probably the uh, most commonly used here on Oahu. Uh, very, very thick um, blades, blades of grass here. Very thick runners, too. Uh, there's uh, out here the uh, Urban Garden Center uh, on, on past the greenhouse area uh, has a, a turf plot, different turf plots. Uh, you might take a look uh, at lunch or whatever out there. It's, they've got a lot of different kinds of grasses out there. Uh, and several kinds of uh, St. Augustine are among them. Uh, this one you have to mow high, two and a half to three inches. Uh, if it's scalped down with a weed eater, it'll die. Uh, it it uh, has very thick, uh, uh, long uh, runners. Uh, the distance between the little plantlets on the runners can some be, you know, an inch or so. So it's not a very dense grass. But those runners, tend, it tends to grow pretty quick. And those runners kind of go over the top of each other so you can get a thatch that's that thick pretty quickly. So it does form a nice, really dense, thick lawn uh, and helps to keep weeds out. Weeds oftentimes, uh, once, it's, uh, once it's established, don't invade. There's uh, St. Augustine right outside the door over here. Uh, you can take a look at the break. Nice, nice, nice grass. Um, weed control, though, is a problem because there's, there's fewer kinds of herbicides, especially grass weeds, grassy weeds, that won't also uh, injure or kill the St. Augustine. Now, there's, there's a few more coming out. Uh, up until just recently, uh, they sold uh, the uh, common uh, grass, uh, crabgrass killer. Um, the active ingredient was MSMA, that some of you may be familiar. It's an arsenical. That's been taken off the market. So you can't buy that anymore. Weed hoe was a good example of that. Uh, that was MSMA. Uh, if you have some, keep it, and, <laughs> you know, because it's really a, still a, a really good uh, crabgrass type of, of uh, uh, herbicide. But you can't use it on 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 this the, the wider bladed grasses because that's what S MSMA kills is the wider bladed grasses, not necessarily weeds, just wide blade grasses. Uh, fertilizing again, not much. Once St. Augustine, oftentimes once it gets established, you don't need to fertilize it even once a year. Um, uh, so once a year at the most. The probably this this is the uh, best uh, uh, quality of um, St. Augustine. Very shade tolerant. It's it's the most shade tolerant of all of the turf grasses. Doesn't take you know, up to 60% shade. If it, again, if it gets some full sun during the day and then shaded uh, later in the day. Uh, that's why they're using it uh, on the medians uh, coming down the poly, for example. Uh, the uh, favorite combination is now Paca Hedge, um, um, St. Augustine grass, 
and then either a monkey pot or shower trees above, you've seen. They're using that combination quite a lot. Uh, and the reason they're using St. Augustine is because of the shade situation caused by the trees. Uh, if they put Bermuda in there, that wouldn't last at all. Uh, all the shade, even from the hedges, uh, it, it just wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't survive. But the way it's, in, in some of these areas, the way the St. Augustine is being mowed too low, uh, it's pretty much gone and it's all weeds now. So here is a good example where a weed eater is not the thing to use. A, just a regular, regular a 21 inch rotary mower, a good, a good mulching rotary mower, and just a, f a few passes on most of these medians up and back would be enough. You know, one person could do it rather than three or four people with a weed eater. Another advantage of that is you don't have to stop traffic, you don't have to cone off traffic because using the weed eaters, oftentimes you're throwing the rubbish out, you have to cone off both sides, you know. You wouldn't need to do that necessarily if you're using a rotary mower. We'll talk more about that. Um, this one needs more water. This one doesn't have deep roots. It doesn't have underground runners, uh, rhizomes. Uh, so it needs to be watered a little bit more consistently. But again, every time you water it, water it deep. But it may need to be watered a little bit more often. Um, one of the, the uh, disadvantages, we'll talk about thatch. If you have this, uh, and we can see it out here, uh, the thatch, which is the underlying brown part of the grass, really does build up very thick. And there are problems when that happens, mostly with mowing, uh, but with other things too, we'll talk about later. Uh, there is a bug that is common, chinch bug, uh, that attacks St. Augustine. It's a tiny little fly uh, that sucks the juice, kind of like aphids, that sucks the juices out of the, the leaves. And whole areas can just turn brown. And that's, that's chinch bug, pretty easily controlled. But it's a fairly common problem with St. Augustine. The other, the other one that's being used a lot now is seashore paspalum. Uh, there's other newer paspalums. There's sea isle and a few other newer kinds of paspalums. But uh, seashore has been out for, oh, I don't know, over 10 years now. Um, really good grass. It's a very thick, thin bladed grass, thinner, not quite as thin as Bermuda, but thinner than uh, zoysia. Um, it uh, is, again, uh, not viable seas. Uh, these are seed heads right here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, all of these will, will form those seed heads, yeah. Um, um, so, um, that, that, but they don't form viable seed. So, um, this is, uh, so they're planted from stolons, runners, again, um, just like, like Bermuda would be, fairly easily done. Um, you can mow this with a rotary mower, but you try to mow as low as you can go. It's best mowed uh, lower than an inch with a real mower because thatch, again, is a big problem with this. It builds up really quick. And the lower you mow, the uh, more uh, time it takes to build up that thatch. Um, so if it's for a road, this is probably not the best selection for roadside. Too high maintenance. Um, uh, there's not that many herbicides available, again. Uh, a lot of them injure paspalum. You can't kill the stuff, uh, but you can injure it with all kinds of herbicides. So it's probably not the best choice for roadside. Uh, again, deep watering is the best. Fertilize, not, you don't have to fertilize it much, not nearly as much as uh, Bermuda. It does need full sun, just like Bermuda. Uh, any shade is going to set it back a little bit. Um, good, again, good wear tolerance, uh, uh, similar to Bermuda. Uh, very fast growing, uh, so it would be a good candidate for um, uh, uh, sports fields, uh, and they are using it a lot on golf courses now, uh, because they can use a real tight mower, uh, because it, it is actually a lot denser than, than Bermuda. Um, if they use it on golf courses, they, they normally use it on the fairways and the, the tee boxes and the greens. The worst thing that can happen to uh, on a golf course is to mix Bermuda and Paspalum because you can't get one out of the other. And there's, and there's lots of golf courses that you might be familiar with, especially on the Big Island, where one has Bermuda, one right next door has Paspalum. And they both have a, uh, this, this issue of one contaminating the other one. It's very difficult. Joe's been doing a lot of work 
trying to get one out of the other. Joe, did you ever? No, he's back. Uh, very, very, very difficult to do. Um, so again, because of the fact that it builds a lot of thatch here, very high maintenance demands in mowing and so forth, not a good choice for roadside. Um, okay, when to mow? That's the question. Now here's the, the mow, no mow situation. Uh, there's a lot of times when there, no mow is, is, the, is, is the good option. On, on slopes and roadsides where you want to prevent erosion, where it's not a danger of trees growing up and so forth, then that's fine. Here's an example of two that you're probably familiar with these areas. Two different uh, areas here on Oahu. Uh, this area here is a much older landscape than this one. This one, I think, is on H2, as I recall, as I took it. Um, so, and H2's been there for quite a long time. This one is right outside, right outside Kailua. Um, that's where I live. That one, if you recall, uh, that used to be just a sheer cliff coming down. This is the Castle Junction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and over a period of years, because of landslides and so forth, uh, what, what I guess DOT did that, yeah, uh, took about half of that mountain. It was a huge project. It took forever. Um, took it down about half and put it way back. A lot, a of, lot of land uh, being moved. Took quite a year and a half or maybe two. Um, but the whole reason for that was to prevent landslide, right? E erosion. After that, and you can kind of see that, you know, the terracing here, you know, going up like they do uh, to, to shave the thing back. And it's just bare rock, basically. They were going back into bare rock. So at that point, it wasn't important to, to, to keep it mowed. You know, the, the whole point was get rid of the erosion situation. So, I th uh, you know, what, what, what was done at first was hydromulch, uh, probably perennial rye and maybe some Bermuda, something to cover it over real quick, and then let it go. Whatever go it comes, comes. And that's, what, three years ago or less? Yeah, two, two. Very quickly, this is the kind of naturalization that, and this is not in the rainforest area, you know. This is not outside of Kailua around the Poly Golf Course. This is, you've got um, Kukui nut trees, you've got coal, got all kinds of trees coming in here, shrubs and so forth. But that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That's holding the, the you know, the uh, slope down. What they're doing here, you can see right along the bottom, is mowing up, weeding up about four or five, six feet to keep the roadside clear. And that's all that needs to be done, okay? Very low maintenance at that point. Now, by and by, I don't know, some of these trees may get big. <laughs> they're, they're growing in bare rock. <laughs> you, know, you know, I don't know. Uh, one of the things I would guess trying to keep out would be Albizia and uh, some of those kinds. Uh, but it, it'll be a while. Probably some of these things down below, uh, if they get too big, would have to be removed before that happens. Uh, but basically, uh, a very low maintenance uh, on a, on a, even on an annual basis. Alternative here is they didn't want this situation. Um, this is more of an intersection that needs to be, not an intersection, but an overpass and so forth. Uh, that needs to be kept clear. Um, so mowing is, is, you know, it has to be done. And really the only alternative to mow on a slope like this are, are weed, weed eaters. Uh, there are some mowers, some boom type mowers, but this is still too steep for that. So this is the only alternative. This is where weed eaters are appropriate, you know. And again, it's, it's weedy grass growing there. It's not fine bladed, you know, you know whatever, if it's green, mow it. So, Keep it down, keep it looking good from the roadside, it's perfect, you know, it looks great. But very high maintenance, you know. Weed eating these areas, I don't know, anybody involved with weed eating areas like this? Is it a constant thing? You, you start and go to one end, come back, and start again, right? Okay, so th these are very high maintenance areas. Okay, so but this is, you know, this is the, uh, kind of some of the questions. Now, down the line, uh, a DOT is trying to develop uh, other kinds of ground covers like peely grass and some of the other ground covers that, that would, would fit that no mow situation out rural areas where you really don't have to mow. As long as the grass doesn't get up you know, more than this and become uh, a hazard, safety hazard for vision, then oh, fine, that's good. You know, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. So they're trying to get more and more ground cover types. And that would help, but it's not going to completely prevent this naturalization thing. Still things can come in even into a peely grass cover. And then, then you've got trouble because you ever been through a peely grass sand? Oh man, 
stick it, it, you can't get through it. It's like, it's like fountain grass, sawgrass. But it's got these little, these little needle-like things going through there. You, you don't want to go into that. You don't want to even mow in there. You, know? you don't want to be there. Uh, so if you get uh, eventual contamination with, say, albizia or whatever that needs to be taken out, then it, then it could be a problem. Um, okay, the best mowing height ranges. This is for uh, the uh, pure turf grass. This is, again, in your book, uh, around page 65 or 6 or something like that. These are the recommended mowing heights for any of the um, uh, common um, warm season grasses. Cobham, Bermuda, one and a half to two. St. Augustine, really, two would be pretty low. Two and a half, maybe, to three and a half would be something better. Um, no more than two, for, no lower than two. Uh, El Toro and so forth, that, these are the recommended heights. Uh, down in here, you don't want to be dealing with these on the roadside because you need a real mower. Yeah. So that's, that's resort type things. Here again, this is in the book. Um, the mowing height for the mixed types of grasses that are common along the roadside, um, they're not a pure species. They, they, they may be more Bermuda than anything else, but a combination of Bermuda and Hilo and uh, all kinds of buffalo grass and all kinds of things. Um, so the standard mowing height for most of these would be around two inches. Yeah. Is, is that, do you use anything higher than that? Yeah. So riding mowers and so forth, which basically is all you're using is riding mowers and weed eaters, right? Uh, your, your mowing height would be normally set at around two inches. Now, there may be cases uh, out uh, in areas where uh, you only have to mow a couple of times a year for fire and so forth, where you may be mowing at six inches or so just to mow it down and get it down and prevent the fire. Are there any places on Oahu like that? Why I side or any places where you need to mow maybe just once a year just to get it down during fire? Okay. Uh, I know Maui has some of those. Um, so um, this is, you know, and this would, even if you had uh, some of these, uh, like, like uh, uh, Bermuda grass, that still is within the range for Bermuda grass. It works fine. So normal mowing heights around two inches. Uh, mowing standards, we talked about this, uh, uh, these, these different divisions um, uh, of uh, uh, urban and so forth, uh, high visibility and so forth. Again, the minimum and the maximum heights are, are this is in your book, uh, uh, starting from very high visibility, this is like mowing standard A, one and a half to three inches. This, this is basically what you're doing a lot of, right? But medians and so forth, two to four. Uh, you would mow at four, and, uh, down to two, and then mow again. It's probably in a couple of weeks, maybe up as much as two or four more. Sometimes if you have the, these uh, clumping grasses, in two weeks it's up to six or seven or eight. It's uh, guinea grass. Yeah. Now that kind of stuff, really, if you have a little patch, uh, it's easier to, to spray it and get rid of it and don't mow it. Yeah. Because uh, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's going to be more of a problem. So, yeah. Uh, Erosion control, behind guard rails, all different kinds of situations here uh, for mowing height. Fire season, here, uh, this is, uh, they do this on Maui, uh, where you mow once a year uh, at five to six inches, just to knock it down so you don't have a big stand of dry grass to burn. Um, and that may be, in some areas here on Oahu, could be uh, the same thing. Okay, why, why are we even talking about mowing height? Why is that important? Well. Basically, the higher the, 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 the uh, grass is mown, uh, the more leaf area, the deeper the roots can go, the healthier the roots. The tops feed the roots. You know, the tops, like any plants, uh, carry on photosynthesis and sunlight, make the sugars and so forth. And that's, the, that's what feeds the plant. There are these sugars and the other things that the, that the leaves make. If, if you're mowing down really low down here, like a golf green level, uh, there's just very, very, very little green uh, area there to, uh, to make the sugar. So there's not enough to feed really a good root system. So if you mow that low on a regular soil, you're going to get very, very shallow roots, which means you, you, you'd be watering, you know, once a day. Okay, good question. So why, why in a golf green? How come? Because this is golf green level. Quarter, uh, a sixteenth of an inch. Okay, the reason is that golf greens are the most pampered plot of earth on, you know, 
it's all sand. It's it's. No, there is all sand. Yeah, uh, the PGA rec you know regulations call for different layers of sand, different size sand, it's to four feet. Drainage. Yeah, uh, and that's and very easy penetration for the roots. So golf greens, even though they're mowed that low, are fertilized and watered daily. You know, almost. They're core aerated. They're pampered. You know, so if you want to cut that low at a, even a thirty-second of an inch, sometimes uh, for Bermuda grass lawns or even bent grass, uh, you have on a, on a reg any other kind of soil base, they're dead. You know, no way. So you have to have that special soil prep uh, only on a golf green. So basically, uh, any other kind of grass, uh, the higher you mow, the more root systems are able to develop. And that would depend really on the kind of grass, you know, that that, that you're using. Uh, hybrid Bermuda, you'd be want to be, you know, in this area here, below an inch maybe, uh, so you get the grass. Uh, utility stuff, that roadside stuff, you know, a couple, three, four inches, two or three inches, um, deeper root systems. So that's the advantage. If you mow too low on on some of these grasses. You're chopping off almost all the green all the green leaves, uh, and right away uh, the, the root system's going to die back. Uh, roots are like uh, just like the tops of the plants; uh, it, it 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 grows and dies back, grows and dies back. You know, just like the tops do. You know, same thing. The roots aren't there permanently. You know, they're only temporary things. Um, okay, what happens then if you mow too low? Well, the the Again, the roots will be too shallow. Uh, they, th there will be just a very small amount of root zone there uh, to take up nutrients and especially water. So you have to water pretty much every day um, for, for those roots. Uh, otherwise, if you're uh, watering deeply uh, every three or four days, you're wasting water. The roots uh, can't support roots going down that deep. Um, so the uh, grass will dry out a lot more quickly, so it has to be more often. Uh, it results in scalping, meaning you're, you're cutting too low, sometimes down right to the dirt, you know, oftentimes at least down into the brown thatch, so it looks bad, you know, it's hard on the mower. Uh, it, it, sometimes it'll, it'll, it'll stop the mower sometimes, you know, with the rotary mower, when you hit that thatch. Um, so you get these unsightly brown patches, uh, weeds come in, um, and erosion. All kinds of things can happen when you mow too low. Uh, basically, though, the, if you go too low, the grass is going to decline uh, uh, because of um, uh, shallow roots. If you go too high, that's better, really, healthier for the grass. But bad things can happen there, too. Uh, if, if you mow higher, uh, you're allowing that underlying brown thatch to develop more. If you're mowing at, say, three inches, you've got all this underlying stuff here to build up all these runners building up over each other. If you're mowing low, then it, there's not as much room you know, for that to happen. You're mowing it off. And you're, and you're keeping the green leafy stuff right at the, at, at the level where it's being mowed. All plants will regrow from where it's cut. Uh, shrubs and trees and grass, same thing. All that regrowth starts from there. Um, so if you get too much of this brown, spongy thatch, um, It'll, the, uh, the first thing you'll see is, is everything is real, like walking on a real thick carpet, you know. You can leave footprints behind even. The problem with that is that the mower is going to sink in, the wheels are going to sink in. And if you have it set at two inches, the wheels sink down, you're really mowing at one inch because that's, you know, your mower is sinking down. It's not on, on, the, on the firm ground. So uh, scalping is the first thing you're going to see. Uh, 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 localized dry spots, um, areas are, just are brown for no particular reason, can be caused by thatch. What happens there, the water is staying, being soaked up by the thatch and not getting down to the roots. Dries out and the roots, uh, it's just like not watering that area. Fairly common with um, uh, uh, Bermuda grass. Uh, you can get lo these localized dry spots. Um, so there's uh, um, insects love thatch too. Caterpillars, army worms, and stuff can get in there and start doing a lot of damage. Fertilizers uh, are not very effective. You can fertilize it; it all kind of sits there in the thatch, not doesn't get down into the roots. 
Uh, herbicides, same thing, kind of sit there, don't do much. Uh, so you're wasting your chemicals when the thatch gets too thick. Um, one thing you can do now when, when that does happen, and this is not going to happen uh, with your roadside situations, because uh, unless it's a, uh, uh, possibly a well-maintained uh, 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 St. Augustine grass, you may have to do this called, called verticutting. And that is, that, that's, that's literally ripping out all that underlying thatch and kind of starting over. Uh, so that may become necessary. Um, this is a, ver a very common thing to be done in, in resorts and, and sports fields and things like that, almost on an annual or high-end launch, too. Um, uh, almost an annual basis if you have uh, Paspalum, for example, or Emerald Joyska, uh, they, they build thatch really quick. Um, and we'll talk more about thatch in a second. Uh, okay, uh, how often uh, should, should, should the grass be mowed? Well, the ideal situation is to follow the one-third rule, which is kind of like the pruning. You know, never remove more than one-third of the, of the green part of the grass. So, for example, if you're mowing at two inches here, you can mow when, it, when one inch more grows up above that. You mow back to two inches, let it grow to three, mow back at two. So you constantly keep it at that level. Uh, that's the ideal situation. The, uh, that means that the schedule isn't, you know, you can't do it every week or every two weeks or every three. You have to do it uh, depending on how fast the grass grows and how, how low it's mowed. Uh, that's why golf greens have to be mowed every two or three days. They mow at one sixteenth of an inch. They have to mow, if they follow this rule, they have to mow again when it grows, what, a 32nd of an inch, you know, to keep that, you know, to keep that same thing. Um, so they have to do it more often. And the reason for that, of course, the golf green, you're not going to be able to putt much if you have grass that, you know, is too high. So there's a reason for it. Um, if you can get away with this, it's fine. Normally, you know, on a commercial basis, uh, it's not very practical, you know. Um, so normally, uh, you set up a schedule that w you're mowing some t within uh, a time frame where the grass doesn't grow too much, but it has plenty of time to, you know, grow back uh, to uh, replenish what was cut before. And every two weeks works great. You know, every two weeks, even for home lawns, is a pretty good schedule to follow. Uh, a lot of home lawns and resorts uh, are more often than that because they want to keep it down lower. Uh, golf courses, even the fairways, again, uh, are probably cut more often than every two. Uh, but for roadside, this is the, the uh, normal schedule, right? Every two, as much as possible, barring rain and so forth, two to three. Uh, and that works fine. Uh, that, that stays within uh, the uh, limits for mowing uh, any kind of grass. Okay, uh, some of the stuff that should be done before mow preparation and cleanup. Again, a lot of this is with the debris, the rubbish removal, that kind of thing. Um, make sure you get rid of all that before, even in the, in the medians, the ditches, the swales, and so forth. Um, always uh, at, at the end of your job, make sure that you're blowing any clippings and stuff back into uh, the uh, um, uh, median or the roadside, not onto the road. Uh, there are some payment deductions for private contractors uh, for failure to do this. Uh, but um, the main thing is to make sure the roadway is, is, is clean and safe during and after mowing. Uh, sometimes uh, it's not a good idea to mow, basically when it's too wet. Um, you don't want heavy equipment in like a riding mower. That might be a good time to do some trimming with weed eaters and that kind of thing. Uh, but if it's too wet, there's two things. Uh, first of all, it can be dangerous um, to the operator if you're on some kind of a slope. You know, it's slippery. Uh, another thing is, if it's really wet, you're going to be leaving ruts and so forth uh, that may or may not recover very, very quickly. Uh, it's all muddy. It, it looks worse after you mow than before. Uh, so definitely stay out of the area then. Um, and um, otherwise, um, wait until it's, until it's drier, you know, whatever that might be. Winter time, sometimes you might go, what, four weeks? If really, really wet. Kind of depends on the weather. Uh, but nothing you can do about that. Um, it, here again, we just talked about this a little bit ago. Uh, in areas that have heavy invasive weeds, 
try to re if it's practical, try to remove them first before you continue to mow. The more you mow, the more you're going to spread them, and the more, and worse it's going to get, and the harder your job becomes. Especially if you have little clumps of guinea grass here and there, you know. Uh, rather than mowing through that and then make that clump getting bigger and bigger and bigger, spray it. Uh, Roundup. Just zap it, you know, with a uh, with a, um, a spot spray of Roundup. Um, let it die back, and then uh, very quickly it'll it'll not be a problem. Um, so that's one of the things that probably could be done more of. Uh, especially in high maintenance, uh, high visibility areas, but even in areas uh, uh, like along uh, H3 and, and uh, H2 and so forth where you're mowing, it just makes it, it easier if, on, if you get rid of it before it gets to be a problem, just with a, maybe a once a month or once every six months, whatever it takes, uh, for somebody to go out there with a backpack and squirt some Roundup. Um, here again, kind of a uh, summary of that, uh, the, the, the rainy weather, uh, leaving clippings and so forth on the ground. Uh, this is an example of scalping, what scalping looks like. Uh, this is in a residential emerald zoysia lawn. But all these brown spots here, uh, you're mowing too low, you're mowing into the thatch. Really, it's still part of the grass. Uh, but it, it's brown. It grows back, but it looks bad. Uh, and it's really hard to mow because um, it gets so thick. Um, here again, this is a closer look up at thatch. Again, this is emerald zoysia. Um, the thatch itself looks like this. It's, it's the brown stemmy parts of the grass. It's, the, it's a living part of the grass. Dirt's down here, the roots and so forth should be growing down there. Thatch gets this thick, sometimes the roots start growing into the thatch. And that's not good. It'll dry out, uh, you're wasting water and so forth. So with, when this happens, the uh, green part of the grass is just this little bit up here. Maybe in this case, this is like two inches. Uh, uh, the green part of the grass is the top this much, you know. So anything you cut into is going to cut into that brown stuff. The surface, oftentimes, you can see this clumpy stuff. This is the emerald and pokey grass. This is one of the things you'll see on the top surface. These little mounds come up, you know. And that's what you cut into when you scalp and you leave a brown circle. You know, like that. So these are some of the things th th that happen just with mowing uh, when, when you get too much thatch. Water penetration, sometimes with this one, uh, emerald zoysia you're familiar with probably, real fine bladed pokey, they call it pokey grass. Sometimes when the thatch gets this thick and, and you water it, the water just sits right on top, doesn't, doesn't go in. It'll evaporate and, it's, and, and you get these localized dry spots. Um, OK, here again, this is the problems we just talked about. Scalping damage, water infiltration, localized dry spots, insects, fertilizer, uh, pesticide uh, don't, don't, uh, don't work very well. So at that point, after it gets to be about a one inch or more thick, that's when it begins to cause problems oftentimes, um, depending on the kind of grass. Uh, then it's time to do something about it. Um, and the only thing you can do is remove it. Uh, and unfortunately, the thatch is underneath the green part, so you can't save the green part and get rid of the thatch, you know. Um, so uh, you, get, you basically are ripping out all of the grass. Um, this, again, will not have to be done probably on most roadside situations unless it's in a high visibility area. For example, maybe this new stuff coming in uh, that was uh, uh, planted in uh, St. Augustine coming in from the airport down Nimitz, that's going to get, if it's cut at the right height, that's going to get patchy, you know. Uh, once a year, you may have to come in and, 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 and treat it. Um, the two heaviest thatchers are the St. Augustine and the Fast Palum, uh, although emerald zoysia is pretty bad, too. Um, the best time, if you're going to remove this, the best time to do this is in the summer when the grass is growing well because it, 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 it's going to have to recover. Again, you're basically ripping it out and letting it grow back. Uh, so you don't want to do this in the winter. Uh, it, it, grass grows too slow in the winter. You've got more chance for weeds coming in. It's going to look bad for a longer period of time. So the best time is in the spring through the fall here in Hawaii uh, and avoid the winter months. Um, in order to do that, most of this underlying brown thatch uh, should be at, at 
at, somehow get rid of it. And you can scalp it down with a weed eater, with a rotary mower, or, or any kind of a mower, because you're going to have to rip it out anyway, okay, if it's really, really thick. So you want to just, just, just cut it down as low as you can any way you can do it. And weed eaters work fine, rotary mowers work fine, because all of that's got to go. So very quickly you're down to little stubbles of, um, of the thatch. Now oftentimes you can leave it at that and let that grow back. But if you leave an inch or so, you've already got too much thatch, you know. So, uh, and, and, and you've cut it unless you're using a weed eater scalping it down. Uh, that's about as far as you can go. Now is when you need a special machine called a verticutter. Um, keep in mind, though, that uh, all new grass that grows back when you take this off is going to grow back from the runners that are left behind. So if you scalp it all the way down to the dirt, and there's no above ground runners, uh, if that grass doesn't form underground runners, then you're not going to have anything to grow back from. You're going to not get anything to grow back, or very, very slowly. The only grass like that uh, that would need to be verticut is St. Augustine. So with St. Augustine, you don't want to take it all the way down to the dirt and leave nothing behind. With, with seashore past phallum, and with Bermuda grass, you can take it right down to the dirt because there's lots of underground runners and all the new growth is going to come from that. So you don't have to re-stolenize, you don't have to reseed. It's all going to come from what's already there. Um, here's an example of commercial uh, operation um, where uh, they had St. Augustine and this is in a raised bed. This is on the fifth floor of uh, Yacht Harbor Towers all raised bed, pool deck stuff, you know, artificial kind of a situation. But they had St. Augustine. It was really doing well. But the thatch was like literally like this. Uh, so they couldn't mow it anymore. They were having to weed eat it and it looked terrible. So the first thing that we did here is to uh, uh, just take a regular rotary mower and mow it down, scalp it down as far as you can go, then follow up with a weed eater and take it down some more. Now, with St. Augustine, you know those, those big fat runners, um, there's a lot, layer after layer after layer, okay? Even with a weed eater, uh, you, you can't get everything down to, to a point where uh, you have just enough left to grow. So in this, in this case, then, you're going to use a machine like this called a verticutter uh, that has blades like a flail mower that, that operate this way, free swinging blades that will swing down and, and actually go down to dirt level and just kind of rip out what's left. So what, what he's doing here then is running over that area and you can still see a lot of runners left here. It's all brown, all the green stuff's gone. But all these are still brown, you know, just regular runners, still maybe like that thick. So what he's doing now is just ripping those up, chopping them up. He's not taking everything out. Um, and you're going to end up with a big pile of stuff. Now, when, when you're doing this part of it here, uh, depending on the kind of grass, the, the blade setting is pretty important. Uh, these blades are, again, free swinging blades that come down like a knife and just kind of cut into the soil, uh, similar to a flail mower. Uh, but the closer they are, the more you're going to get. With St. Augustine, again, you don't want to be taking all of those runners out. So you want better spacing on the, on, on the, on the knives. And there's, uh, there's, there's whole axle, you know, kinds of, of replacement things with different kinds of knives on it that you can just take out and put in. Um, so the blade spacing here uh, needs to be more for St. Augustine and Centipede uh, because all of that new growth is going to come from the above ground stolons, not the rhizome. Um, okay, here's an example of uh, at the end of verticutting. Uh, you can see here, I think, uh, the big pile of, of, of uh, runners here, big pile over here. This is after going over it three or four times with the rotary mower, scalping it down, raking it off. You still have that much left. And at the end, you have still here, this is St. Augustine, you have the kind of a single layer of runners here. And th they look dead. They're just, they're, you know, there's they're, they're no green left on them. But they're all still rooted. They're all rooted. And they all have little little buds on them where the grass is going to grow up again. Very quickly, the grass will begin to grow from these runners. And you treat it just like a new, just a newly planted lawn. 
keep it watered. You don't really have to top dress it, uh, just keep it watered well. Um, th 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 these, uh, these runners here, that's good material for planting a new lawn, for another lawn. That's how they plant a, 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 a St. Augustine lawn, these runners. So the ideal situation if you're a contractor, get some place that needs to be verticut, and the next day you've got another place that needs to be planted. You take it from where to there, and you've got free planting material. You can, you, yeah, you can throw dirt on it, but you don't need to, because it's already rooted. Just right there, yeah. Because all, see, all this, all these little runners here, they're still rooted. Over here, no, over here. Oh yeah, when you plant it, yeah, yeah. Uh, take those out, spread them out, and hydro mulch it with something. Yeah, you can use hydro mulch. Usually, that's what they use now, or you can use uh, compost or dirt. Yeah, you don't want to cover it too much. But yeah, the main thing is make sure it doesn't dry out. Uh, so that's just regular stolonizing. Um, so th so everything then, uh, as far as follow-up care, uh, water it well. A um, couple times a day, just like a newly planted lawn would, would, would require. Uh, if you do need to core aerate, again, this is high-end stuff, this would be the best time to do it. Uh, if your soil is compacted, uh, you don't have much uh, grass there, you can really get a good core aeration. Uh, and then if you need um, fertilizing and all that kind of stuff, be a good time to do that. Uh, Pre-emergent, not a bad idea, because you are going to have some downtime, kind of depending on the, uh, how fast the grass grows. Uh, here, though, is the same area. This was done in the wintertime, which is not the best time to do it, but they wanted to do it then. Uh, this is uh, at the end of uh, this, this uh, mowing it down, getting the weed eater, even before it was uh, verticut. Six weeks later, yeah, real nice. Nice, thin lawn, you know, beautiful. Uh, actually, this is after six weeks. After about four weeks, it was, uh, we started to mow. This has been mowed twice already, mowed oh, once a week. Back. Pardon? Uh, depending upon uh, uh, how well it's fertilized and watered and how fast it grows, three things you don't want to be doing with this. You don't want to water it too much or fertilize it because it's going to grow fast, right? And you want to keep it cut down toward the lower end of the mowing height. Because the higher you mow, the more room it's going to get for the thatch to start building. Yeah. So with this, with, with St. Augustine, Augustine, you always find yourself uh, raising the mowing height a little bit. Time, time, time. And once it gets to this thick, then you do this all over. So you probably end up uh, doing this uh, once a year, once every two years. Yeah. Um, but um, this is called verticutting. Uh, this is more for high-end, you know, uh, work. Um, and you do need that special verticutter. Okay, a uh, little bit more about mowing here. Um, all the different pieces of equipment. Uh, you guys all are familiar with this. Uh, do you use, on Oahu, uh, do you use flail mowers or rotary? Both. Both? Okay. Um, so uh, riding mowers can be, you know, both types. Uh, you might be, uh, do you have any boom type mowers where you can mow in slopes? Yeah. So you guys are all familiar with this. Uh, we'd like to see more use of this. Walk behind rotary mowers <laughs> rather than weed eaters in areas that you can do that in. It's actually a lot quicker, a lot more efficient. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> But no place else, right? <laughs> um, but this is one of the things we're going to do in our hands-on th thing. We're going to compare mowing with a rotary mower and a weed eater, it, both in, in, the, in the quality of the cut and how long it takes to do it. And you can make up your own mind. Um, if you do, though, if you do use these 21-inch uh, rotary mowers, make sure you get a really good quality heavy-duty commercial mower, like a Honda, for example. You know, if you don't, like any commercial business knows this, you know, you're going to be buying three or four a year. You know, so it's better to get a good, high-quality mower. And that would only cost maybe twice as much as one string trimmer. You know? And how many string trimmers do you own? You know? uh, so you can do a lot more with the mower. And this is one of the things we're going to look at. Um, edging, uh, this is one, one other thing we're going to look at, using edgers. Every, you know what an edger is? Little, it's, like, it's got one blade that goes right along the curb. Easy, fast, makes a beautiful um, uh, edge. 
and then of course your power blowers and so forth. Uh, refueling, of course, always away from waterways and off the grass and so forth. So if you spill, you don't uh, kill stuff. Um, okay, the types of mowers that, that, that you'll be using, since most of your mowing heights are over one inch, very seldom are you going to go much. Then your motor, your rotary and your flail mowers uh, are the ones that you want to be using. Um, uh, you're not going to be using real tight mowers uh, because they're not practical, really. You don't have that kind of grass on the roadside. Um, okay, again, emphasizing here, weed ears try to limit it to trimming what they're really meant to be doing and not mowing. You know, if they're inaccessible areas where you can't get even a rotary 21 inch in there, uh, then fine. Okay, weed ears work great. Uh, under guardrails and things like that where you can't get to any other way. Maybe spraying under guardrails is a better idea than using the weed eater. We'll talk about that. Joe already did. Um, OK, places where you're using riding mowers, of course. This is no, uh, medians, interchanges, uh, large areas where you're using a, a riding either rotary or flail type mower. Um, not practical to be using uh, a, a push mower here. Too much area you can get in easily accessible to a riding mower. You might be doing trimming with weed eaters, right, along the edges, underneath signs and stuff. That's fine. Um, slopes, um, a boom type mower, if you have, could be uh, used here, or weed eater, depending on the, the um, slope uh, uh, distance and how, how steep it is. Uh, over here, this is along uh, Kamehameha. I think this is Wadilia, I think. Um, and I think what they're using there is a weed eater there, too. So weed eaters are very practical in, 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 in many situations. Um, OK, here's, here's some, some suggestions, OK? Here's some of the areas where it would be much quicker, much easier, much more economical to use a rotary mulching mower than a weed eater. Areas like this at the bottom of the poly. This is what we're talking about. This is where it's all been weed eated down, very sparse, a lot of weeds, uh, cut too low. Several passes with a good mulching mower, and you're, you're done. You, know? you don't have to close off traffic over here. You're, you're up here. You're not throwing rubbish onto here. Or even a riding mower. One pass with a riding mower, if it'll fit. Yeah, here too, along here. Maybe not quite so much here, because you've got but a riding mower here. If you can get a mower in there, use the mower. Right. Um, under guard rails, weed eater, really, you know, that's the only choice. But it's for trimming, OK? OK, here's another little innovation here we hope you'll adapt. Uh, edging. In high visibility areas, if there's a curb here along the, along the inside of the curb, Rather than whacking it up with a weed eater that takes a while, too, and it's throwing all kinds of rubbish out and rocks and stuff, uh, use an edger. An edger is built for exactly that purpose. Here, for example, here's a nice, pretty, pretty a nicely edged area here. But you can see it here, you, it's also been scalped back with a weed eater. Uh, this is what we'd like to see here, a nice, nice clean edge, which is probably done with a weed eater turned up, turned up like this, you know which works, but it throws stuff all over, and it's not, not as quick, uh, or does a nice job. So uh, these are areas where we would like to see an edger being used. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, exactly. And, and that's, that's what we records are for. Yeah. But the point is, OK, see how they scalp it down here? They're, 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 they're mowing like this, right, down? Keep the weed, keep the string level, and cut at the same height, so you can't tell it's been weed eater. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so, huh? Right here. The other side. Um, yeah, the edge here can 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 be edge. Where 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 at? Yeah. Oh, down here. Down here. Yeah, weed eater. Or spray. Yeah, that, that's where you do have to use it. Yeah. And probably weed eater there is probably there. 
Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, that's a good question because you need to clean this area uh, underneath the curb too, right? Weeds oftentimes will grow there if you can. If you can. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So yeah, what's the alternative? Well, weed eater or spray. Yeah. Uh, every once in a while. Okay, here's here's some areas where we're trying to get more more uh, spray. Joe showed this the other day. Here under. That's not natural. That's weeds. That's really healthy. At least we don't want that to be taken as natural, right? So here, long hair, long hair. All of this coming down the poly. I travel the poly, so I pick it on the poly. Um, all of this, see all these weeds here? None of that, it's all growing in the, in the blacktop. There's no dirt there at all, you know? Not supposed to have any kind of thing. Spray it, you know, once in a while. Knock it down. And I notice you're doing it. Uh, anybody work on this part of the poly? Are you spraying? Are you doing more spray? It's very obvious. It looks good. Yeah. Because this now isn't there anymore. Right. This looks good. Yeah. And, and I'm noticing more and more spraying going on. Uh, did you do that during the day or night or what? Daytime? No complaints? You do have? Complaints? Nobody complain? Okay. Okay. But this, how often do you think you're going to have to do this? Not, not, a, not every two weeks, right? Yeah, every other month. And you don't have to weed eat now, right? Okay, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, maybe a little bit more in the wintertime. Winter. Yeah. But this is, this is a good alternative, yeah. And, and, and uh, I was just noticing coming down the poly the other day. All, all these are gone, and I didn't notice any weed eating going on. You just sprayed them, huh? Yeah, yeah. So more of this, I think, uh, is, um, and Joe was talking about you can do it from, how do you do that? A backpack walk or truck or? Truck? OK. Uh, OK, very quick, we've already covered this on uh, safety. Uh, visibility, make sure that you and your mower are visible, uh, wearing all the right PPE. Uh, direction, if you can, mow in the direction of traffic. Sometimes you can't do that especially if you have a side charge, um, side discharge rotary mower we talked the other day. You don't want to be throwing things out into traffic, right? So sometimes you have to mow with your back to traffic because of that. Um, flail mowers, do they throw more out front or what? Side? Too? Okay. Uh, but you don't want to be discharging anything out into traffic, but as much as you can, uh, Move in the direction of, if you're weed eating and stuff too, move so that you can see oncoming traffic. You know, you can get out of the way. You know, um, that, that's just for your own safety. Um, and then throw any discharge, throw into, uh, not into the traffic, but into the roadside. Uh, equipment again, uh, all these kinds of things rotating lights, flashers, uh, flags, uh, all kinds of cones and things. Uh, that's all OSHA stuff, uh, and that's only for your safety, only for you. That's for you to be safe on the roadside. Um, warning signs here again, all these things. Uh, keep, make sure your signs are moving with you. Again, I don't want to pick on poly guys, but sometimes when you're um, uh, weed eating down the medians from the tunnel all the way down into Kailua, it's, 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 it's coned off all the way down, you know. And that's regulation, I suppose. You have to, all the curves and stuff, you know. But uh, try to move as much as you can so uh, you, you don't back up traffic, you know, as little as possible, right? Uh, but sometimes you can't. You can't do that. Um, okay, so um, these are all safety things. Uh, uh, slopes, going on slopes, you do have some side-mounted boom-type mowers uh, that you can use. Not on a wet surface, but... Uh, on other surfaces. Um, if you do that, make sure the boom is on the uphill side and you have a roll bar so you, you're balanced. You don't want the boom down here. You know, you're going to go that way. Um, so make sure you're mowing again in the right direction with all the protection. Um, 
If you can't do that, then uh, handheld uh, operation, uh, weed eaters. Uh, uh, have you ever used those uh, hover mowers? They use them on golf. Those are kind of neat. I don't know why they don't use them. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, they just kind of come up off the ground. They kind of ride on air. It's like a glorified weed eater. Uh, they use them on golf courses around sand traps because they can't get down in there. Uh, I've, I've seen, not here, but I've seen slopes being mowed like that where they put it on a, uh, to get it going and put it on a rope and just let it go down the hill. Yeah. And they, cool. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know of anybody that does that here. <laughs> okay, here on Oahu, we're already doing this a lot. We'd like to see where it's appropriate in inner city areas, more mulching around trees. Uh, it's a good way to get rid of wood chips. Uh, you don't have to, tippage now is getting pretty expensive for landfill. Um, every, every, twice a year maybe, replenish it with no more than two or three inches of wood chips around the base of the trees. Make sure that you don't put the wood chips right up against the base of the tree. You know what happens when that happens? When it rots, yeah, the tree rots, the bark rots. So make sure that it's a way, but this makes a good guard uh, for mowing and so forth. You don't have to weed wet. Exactly, yeah. And if, if you do have to weed, you can spot spray. Yeah. And weeds oftentimes don't come in here, but don't use compost. Use wood chips. Compost, two things about compost, uh, or grass clippings. Once they dry out, they actually <laughs> repel water. Water kind of rolls off. Uh, so the uh, underside of the tree is going to stay dry. Uh, and also, weeds love, love to germinate and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So wood chips are the best. Good, good size wood chips, you know, not little ones. Um, okay, edging and, and weeding. That's the last thing we're going to cover. What is edging? Edging is making an even vertical cut this way along, along the sidewalk, a nice uh, thin, not one inch wide trench, like you know you can do with a weed eater. A very thin, narrow, not so deep edge to either the curb or the sidewalk. In, in most of your cases, it'll be on the curb, not the sidewalk side. And using an edger, this is a tool designed only for that purpose. That's the only thing that that, per that piece of equipment is used for. It's a power edger, very similar to a weed eater, same you know, uh, power unit and so forth, except it's a knife that, that, that rotates, one single knife that rotates this way. Um, it'll cut uh, about an inch thick as wide as the blade. That's as wide as it's going to cut. And you can actually use the blade up against the curb as a guide. And as you're doing this, you should hear that blade scraping a little, not clunking, but scraping up against the, the curb. And you know that you're right up on it. That actually helps to, to uh, sharpen the blade, too. So you're using, yeah, yeah. So, you're, so and, and, and there's a little roller <laughs> on there. So it, it goes real quick, a lot, a lot, and you'll see, a lot quicker. Okay, here's, here's, here's what the, the edger looks like here. Just a single blade on a roller. This is called a stick edger. It's the simplest one to use. There's more complicated ones with four wheels and stuff, but th this, were, this is the better one to go. But you can see here this, um, this nice tight edge along here that he's cutting. You can see the uncut area here. And what he's doing is just following the edge of the sidewalk, in this case, and, 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 and by sound, uh, you can tell that you're right on. Um, and, and feel, you can kind of tell. If you tend to drift off to the right, you know, you're going to make a gouge, you know. That, that sound is, is actually what's guiding you, uh, and it's very, very fast. Uh, I'll challenge anybody to a race. <laughs> Edging, and I get the edger, okay? Um, okay, and here's what, uh, here again, this is an uh, urban area. A, a nice edge like this can be cut. Okay, what's trimming? Well, that's the weed eater. And trimming is this way, horizontal. And it's meant to be used only in areas that can't be mowed, underneath signs, underneath, uh, cur uh, underneath uh, uh, roadside signs, trees, and so forth. Um, uh, any area that a lawnmower can't go, uh, then a weed eater is fine. But if you're doing that, um, 
these are some of the, okay, here's, here's what it's meant for, really. Trimming around the, the uh, trees where the moor can't get into along here, along the edge where maybe a moor can't get into. Notice here there's a little bit of a, uh, a uh, scalped area where they've actually taken the grass away so they don't bark up uh, against the tree. It's not mulch, but at least it's, it's, it's edged there. And they did that with an edger. They cut it around with an edger. Uh, and uh, this area here, over here on this side, you know, he can do that with an edger. Real nice, nice line. Uh, this is improper use uh, of a weed eater. It works. A lot of people do it. But what happens? Well, where does all the debris go? Bam, bam, bam. Right at you, right? Yeah, right at your face. Or it's, it's going to be thrown out into the sidewalk, rocks, so forth. Not, 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 a, not a safe thing to do. And it doesn't do as good a job as an edger, and not as quick. Uh, Oftentimes you'll see edging like this, where it's up against, that, rather than going vertical, you're just kind of whacking it back off the sidewalk, or it goes this way, where you're scalping it back off. It doesn't look good, and, it, and it, you're scalping the grass, you're actually getting weeds coming in because it's bare dirt. Uh, the edger doesn't leave any of that. The edger actually uh, has a guard on it. You see this guard here above? So all, all the debris goes straight down. Rocks and stuff don't fly around. And you don't leave a lot of rubbish on the sidewalk here, very little. Uh, with the um, a trimmer here, there, there's a, you can see here a lot of rubbish going onto the sidewalk, which is a safety issue too. Um, okay, where are we asking that you use edging to trim? High visibility urban areas, you know. But actually, if you're going to trim and there's a curb there, and you're going to trim it, why not use an edger? It's quicker. It's better, even in rural areas. You know, If there's a curb that you have to edge once in a while, an edger is a lot quicker. You only need one of them. You don't need 10. You know? One per crew. You know? um, OK, so that's basically what we're talking about. OK, here's the difference between edging and trimming. Um, uh, one thing on a, on a uh, weed whacker, and I'm, you're probably uh, aware of this, there's curved shaft and straight shaft, right? This is, the, this is the commercial version, straight shaft, right? This is for homeowner stuff. This one, too, oftentimes you can change the heads from various kinds of things, you know. So this is a commercial type. They turn in different, different ways, right? This one goes counterclockwise to the left, right? This one goes this way, OK? That, now, that makes a difference. Because that's where your that's where your all your all your debris is going to be thrown, just like a lawnmower. You know, you, you all know that the, the weed whacker throws it out to the left, rocks, grass, whatever. Okay, so in order to not throw rubbish out here, this is along Alabama Boulevard, out into traffic, mow, uh, weed eat so that you're that you're moving in a direction where it's being thrown to the left, all all over here. That that reduces cleanup. All your rubbish is not all, but all your rubbish is going in. And you're eliminating throwing rocks and stuff out. That's the main thing, safety. So uh, on, on the roadside, same thing. Move in the direction that you're throwing it in and not out. Uh, and, and the main thing there is safety there. Because weed eaters can pick up rocks and throw them just like mowers can, even more so. You know? There's probably more broken windows from weed eaters than mowers, I would guess. So it's a safety thing. Um, OK, so that's the main thing to, you know, to realize. Uh, also, uh, some of the things about the straight shaft, um, rotating counterclockwise, uh, uh, keeping it pointed in. But use the left side of the string as your leading cutting path. So as you're cutting, move to the left rather than to the right, if you can. Now, oftentimes, you're going back and forth, right? But if you're you know, just going around a, a small area here, you're moving in one direction. If you're, if you're doing it so that the cutting edge is to your left, you get a much better cut, a much more even cut. If you go the other way around and try to go to the right, it'll catch often, because the string's going on opposite. It'll catch in the scalp. So you get a much uh, easier cut if you're cutting with the leading edge to the left. And be aware that that's the direction that the rubbish is going to. Um, OK, uh, all the stuff opposite here for the these here. OK, 
another thing with the weed eaters, don't scout. You know, you don't have to go down. To, it's not meant to go down to the dirt. Yeah. Use, use your weed eater to trim at the same as the mowing height of the mower. That way you can't tell, you know, if it's weed eater or, or mowed. Um, and you, you don't get those, that scalp look. You don't get the erosion and all that. So use the same mowing height. OK, uh, some of the things here real quick that uh, uh, make, you know, when you're trimming some of the things, you're trimming around uh, irrigation heads and things like that, or you, you don't want to be mowing around those, leave plenty of room around. And that's where the weed eater comes in, you know, uh, areas that you don't want to be running into around rocks and so forth, bases of trees and so forth. Um, don't, don't use any chemical edging. Uh, meaning Roundup or something like that for edging purposes, uh, unless it's for uh, uh, the elimination of weeds itself. Um, sometimes you're, you're tempted to use Roundup along the roadside to edge. You know, you're going to kill off. You don't have to weed either anymore. Um, that's, that's not you know, permitted um, for several reasons. One, if you use Roundup for that, uh, since it's a systemic, it, it doesn't kill just where it hits, right? It, 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 goes back and it makes it really rough. Yeah. If you're going to do that, use Finale. Finale. Yeah. That, that, that is, it, it's, it's like Roundup, but it's not systemic. And, it, and if you're going to be edging like that, use it there. It's, it's good for under, um, under uh, say, a fence line where you don't want a big, big um, kill zone. It's, it's OK. Yeah. Uh, well, not, no, no, not, not if you've got running water. Yeah, not running water. Yeah, uh, you shouldn't be spraying anything if you've got running water. Roundup, though, actually uh, uh, disintegrates pretty quick when it hits the soil. Pretty safe. Very important too, proper PPE anytime you're mowing and so forth. That's to protect yourself, eye, ear, uh, all that. Chap uh, for for weed eating, chaps are, are a leg protection is a good idea. Uh, using edgers uh, in high visibility areas, again, along curbs and sidewalks. Um, curbing gutters, keep them clear. Now here again, with gutters, if there's a curb on top, you can edge in, in high visibility zones. At the, at the bottom of the gutter, where it comes into the street, and there's weeds along there, either spray or weed eat. That's the only chance, that's the only alternative. Um, now with edging, you may not, you, you, you don't have to do that every time. Once a month, once every, you know, whatever. Because you just want to keep that line nice and crisp. Then you don't need to do it all the time. Um, vines and stuff, of course, you don't want to have any of that take over, overgrowing fences and so forth. Um, it says here, edge or trim every time you mow. Um, no. Not trimming, yes. You should be weed eating around the base of signs that every time you mow just as a part of mowing. Oftentimes, it, I see uh, maybe it's too wet or something where you didn't have time or didn't, this didn't you know, trim around the base of a stop sign or a little triangle out there, and it gets this high. You know? uh, so you should be trying to, you know, to trim every time you mow, but not edge, not necessarily edge. Um, keep away from the base of trees. Uh, you, you, you can if you want to uh, install protective guards, but it's easier just to mulch. Um, or, or uh, take, 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 uh, take a, uh, make a roundup kill around you know, the base. Uh, just don't spray the tree. But you can keep it free just with roundup as well, too. Um, not in urban areas, or, but in rural areas. Um, training courses like these every once in a while. Uh, especially invasive species, what Christy was talking about. You, you really are probably the most important people in the state to help control the spread of invasive species because they usually will, will, will get started along the roadside. And you're the guys out there every day seeing what's happening on the roadside. So keeping in touch with, uh, the, uh, with Christy, who's not a bad person to keep in touch with, by the way, um, to, uh, <laughs> for more than one reason. Um, 
um, to, because they'll come out and do the work, you know. They'll come out, and, and if you see an invasive species there, uh, the, the, they have crews. That's what these guys do. They'll come out, and they'll survey the whole area, and they'll make sure that it's not a problem yet. So your job is to report it right away. Um, report time and effort spent for mowing, edging, trimming, all this, all the reporting stuff. Um, is, and also, too, workshops like this. You're being paid for this, right? Most of you. Uh, so you report this, your time here uh, is just as valuable here as it is out on the roadside for at least right now. Um, so making sure you report all that. Um, and proper tools and all that. We don't need to go through you know, all this again. Um, and, and now, one, one difference here may be no mow areas, more, more, more. No mow areas, especially in rural areas being developed as they come up with some alternatives for what can go there. Uh, you're likely to see more, which is going to reduce your time. You're going to have more time to spend on other things. OK. Um, let's see, is Shaheen? So we got a quiz, and then we can go outside, and then we can have lunch. Um, hold on. C can we have the lights right there by you? Okay, that sounds good. Can I have one too? Before they go any further. Thank you. Okay, I want to go through this. A couple more minutes.
Oh, there's a big bug flying around back there. I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> oh, oh, it, they, they like to nest in there, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the carpenter bee. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I noticed that at home, too. I couldn't figure out where they were going, but they... <laughs> They come up, yeah, the bamboo chimes. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Uh, okay, number one. Weed eaters are recommended for maintaining all grass in the row. Huh? False. Right. Two, it is safest to mow near the lower end of the recommended mowing height for all grasses. That's false, yeah, in the, mid in the middle part. Somewhere in the middle is better. Not too high, too low. Number three, heavy thatch buildup is often caused by not mowing enough at mowing heights that are too high. True, yeah. Not mowing enough, it means it grows too much, and mowing high it gives it a lot more room to, to build up. Um, so mowing more frequently somewhere toward the middle of the mowing height is best. Number four, uh, your row contract requires you to trim an edge each time you mow in the urban areas. True and false, right? <laughs> yeah. Trim, yes. Yeah, you should be trimming with the weed eater around signs and stuff, but not necessarily trimming. Um, I mean, edging. Yeah, edging could be less often. Um, so, yeah, it's true for trimming and false for edging. Okay. okay, five. You should not mow areas with heavy weed infestation until the weeds have been removed. True, if you can, yeah. Huge areas, that's not practical, you know. But if you have little clumps of guinea grass here and there, it's better to spray them and get rid of them. The more you mow, the more you're going to spread them, the more problem they're going to be. Number six, weed eaters may be used on slopes if boom side mowers are not available or practical. True. That's your only choice, really. Unless you have those hover mowers, those things are cool. Number seven, herbicides, not weed eaters, should be used to control weeds under guardrails in narrow medians and road sites. True, works really well, you guys are already doing it. Um, eight, you should always mow facing oncoming traffic as much as possible, true, for your own safety. Number nine, weed eaters are recommended for edging along sidewalks and curbs in urban areas. False, edgers are more preferred. 10, weed eaters are to be used only for trimming where mowers cannot reach in other areas. True, yeah. Use a mower if you can. 11, a trim mower, such as a 21-inch rotary mower, mulching mower, is faster and gives a higher quality cut compared to a weed eater. True. 12, the first sign of heavy thatch is constant scalping during mowing. True, oftentimes that's your first clue. Uh, 13, verticutting is a type of mowing that removes excess heavy thatch. True. 14, cutting height when uh, using weed eaters should be lower than the mowing height. False, should be the same, same level, so you can't tell the difference. And horizontal and not at an angle, yeah. Uh, 15, rotary and flail mowers are recommended for mowing at heights above an inch. True, right, okay. Um, Okay, um, we're going to go outside now and uh, do s uh, several things. Uh, one, we're going to compare uh, a riding mower, uh, rotary type riding mower, uh, a 21 inch mulching Honda push mower, self propelled actually, uh, and a weed eater. We're going to use those three methods for, for mowing, not necessarily for training, but for mowing. And three things, or two things really you're going to look at. How fast is it? And how well does, what, what's the job look like? You know? And also, how easy it, how, how uh, which one's easier on the operator? All those three things. Okay? So we have uh, a riding mower and a mulching mower and a weed eater set up out over here in the corner. Then after that, we're going to come back over here. We don't really have any good curbs here that we can show you the edger. But we do have an edger, and I think you can get the idea of how, how fast it is. 
Uh, so after that, we'll come back over here and do a little bit of edging, and then it's time to eat. Okay. For all you guys out in the field, this staff PPE, your personal protective equipment. So we start off with your eyeglasses. It should be ANSI approved, which we'll say Z87. And it's always embossed up here, someplace on it. So again, safety glasses are important. Uh, what ended up happening was, uh, last a couple weeks ago, we ended up doing a workshop on Maui, and I gave Jay my face shield, because I had to leave, and so he's still doing some of the classes. So for the last week, I didn't have a face shield. And then I'm out weed in a rock game and shot me in the lip. So I don't have fur this is actually where a rock <laughs> shot me in the lip and you know busted my lip open. So, you know, it's not the end of the world, but it's certainly a lot easier if you actually have something to protect you with that. Uh, again, glasses are critically important. A lot of people get permanently hurt. If rock hits your eye, it will shatter it. So it's not a big deal to wear these. Um, what we're actually doing this experiment is to show you guys the productivity of the weed whacker versus the mower versus the ZTR, zero turning radius mower. So I think the outcome is very predictable. It's just percentage wise how much you guys are aware, you know, we're going to be ahead. So if you want to bring your, do you have any questions on how this works or anything? Oh, we got it. Okay, so the weed whacker, he's going to weed whack this area and go down as far as he possibly can. And I'm going to mow the center area and come back, you know, as fast as I can. And Jay's going to do the same thing. And then based on that, you can kind of see what the productivity is of using one piece of equipment versus the other. So we're just going to go down to the park. Yeah. Uh, this is set on two. Is that too low? Uh, it probably is. What I wanted, because this area was just mowed, so I specifically mowed. So we're okay. 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 One thing, if you notice, this is a tap and feed head. I know a lot of you don't have to come up doing that. That's all tuned up. So. When you guys actually use a fixed line, you're using roughly about, you know, four to five inches of line. This is 24 feet off. So most of the time, we're all working out in the field. You get a rock, you know, your line's gone like that. In this situation, when it goes down low, you're going to hear the RPMs rev up. You just hit it hard while you're pulling the trigger. Typical force allows the exact amount out that is cut right through here where the blade is on the shield. So, now because it's also, you need to have that in the exact place. With tap and feed, you don't have guys moving the shields around. So, we probably all experience within our company or organization, a lot of guys take the shields off. Again, that's not OSHA approved and it's a hazard not only for pedestrians, your fellow workers, but also for, you know, the public traffic that we're usually working with. Uh, anyway, so what we're going to do, we already started up, and we'll start our engines, and then when someone says go, we'll go. And we'll see how it looks. Okay, now, what, what, you know, one thing we want to, with, with the weed in here now, too, we, we, we want you to go between the pylons all the way back, not just boom, 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 down, you know. So you, you, you're... you're uh, once, once Mark starts here, here, it'll right. go down here and over to there, okay? And then also be, be aware of the, of the direction of your of your debris, and, and uh, we, we don't want it to be scalped either, okay? So, yeah. yeah. So this is already pretty low, yeah. Yeah, this has been mowed already, so we don't want you to scalp it down any lower necessarily. Yeah. Make it look as nice as you can. Okay, hold on here.
backwards. Why is that not a good thing? Because you're not going to know if there's a hole in back, if there's a split in the ground, or if there's somebody walking by or traffic. And all the people are over here, so maybe he doesn't like some of you, and that's why he wants to shoot rocks in your direction. I don't know. But you want to always keep your back away from where you want to shoot rocks. So it's always best to go forward for your safety as well as others.
That was a good job. Good job. So as you can tell, the mower was about four times faster than the weed whacker, and the ZTR, the same thing, about four times faster than the walk behind mower. The productivity is a huge difference, but if it's more than that, if you look at where Jay mowed, it's more of a uniform, you know, cut. So it's a big difference in quality. So when you're dealing with situations like this, again, you know, Jay's is more uniform than the weed whacker. And that's basically what we really want to go for, is not only increasing productivity, but also to the end result of quality being far superior. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, one thing I'd like to point out here too, uh, that mower was set low just so we could see where we have been because this has been mowed recently. It was set a little too low. We did a little bit of scalping. So it should have been set. The mowing height was too low. So we should have set it up a little bit. And if it was next week, you know, the grass would be up high enough that we would have a nice, more even cut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things to, for you guys to be aware of, what's one of the major forms of fatigue when we're out in the field? What? And what else? Beef? Yeah, and what else? Noise. Noise is something that we really overlook. So this is a major form of fatigue. And any of you guys work around trees or chippers? Okay, most of the chippers, the decibel is around 80. Do you know what your average earmuff is rated? Anybody? 28 to 33. So even if you take the little plugs, which are usually only rated around 18 or 19, you're still being bombarded with 30% more noise, you know, than what any of your safety thing is going to be able to protect you. So again, that's another way of fatigue that you try to prevent. So most of the time when I'm working around a chipper or, you know, equipment that's louder, I'll put in the earplugs plus I'll have the earmuffs. The other thing that's really important about this is, you know, face shields, whether you're working around weed whackers or mowers or even chippers, but this does protect you as my lip, you know, is evidence of. So it's something that if you have a screen, they're not going to fog up, they're user friendly, you know, it just helps you guys out a little bit more. Plus, if you're doing any of the projects like I'm doing, a lot of times there's dog feces out there and you're not splattered in the face or mouth, it protects you a little bit more. So it's just one more way to make your job, which is a very hard, difficult job to do, a little bit easier. Okay, want to do the edger? Yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to just kind of demonstrate how the edger works. There's not a good curb to do it with, but over on the other side, there is a, uh, at least a sidewalk. Uh, and then while we're over there, too, uh, I want you to take a look at the um, uh, St. Augustine lawn, which is out there, and then on beyond that a little bit, the Emerald Zoysia. Uh, we'll be over there anyway. You can see what those look like. Okay. Uh, in this situation, we're using the sidewalk here because edgers need a place to have the blades rubbing again. So out over here, which is common for a lot of you guys to deal with, you can't use an edger because obviously with the blacktop, it's not even, it's not level. Even where the grass is usually grown over it, you can't really adequately do it. Whenever possible, when you have a curb, again, these work best when you have the blade pressed against the curb and then you can go. A lot of times, the curb areas will be overgrown with grass. This is by far the most efficient way to do it. With that said and done, with this sidewalk, why wouldn't we be able to use that uh, edger properly? The curb is higher than the grass. You guys all hear that? So obviously, that wouldn't be the most appropriate place for an edger. Again, this is the only place where we actually have an area where I can even show you for an edger. So in this situation, like Jay said, you want to take the weed whacker and blend it in to the existing area at the same height that the mower was, not gouge it in. So I'm going to just go through and show you guys, you know, a 
the speed that an engine does. And then we can go through and show you how in this situation you might have to use a weed whacker because the edger is not going to give you that really pretty nice line. Do you have anything you want to add, Jay? No, let's go. Now that's as fast as you could go if you were if 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 the grass and the curb was at the same height, you can still go that speed. And you're getting a nice tight line. <laughs> so watch me with a weed whacker and I'll try to go as fast as I can. I'm sure some of you guys are probably faster than me, but you'll be able to see the difference in productivity. on its side, like a lot of us do, what happens? Why is this a bad thing? Why? It flings rocks. So again, that's a hazard for the public as well as your co-workers. The other thing it does, it trenches an area. And in a lot of these areas, you're going to have irrigation that might not be the spec. So it might just be a few inches under the ground. And in areas like this, this is typically where they're going to put the sprinkler line, right up to a sidewalk shooting into the grass, not shooting over a sidewalk. So then you're looking at possible breaking of irrigation lines or even the sprinklers themselves. So again, you know, there's many different reasons to use an edger versus a weed whacker. And a weed whacker certainly has its place as I just demonstrated. You have to do it in a situation like this. But I just want to demonstrate that that does have a place and your final result is far better with an edger than a weed whacker. Any input or questions? You know one thing that I, I was pointing out too, the direction that you're moving to your left, I noticed you were going to your right all the time and, you, and, it, and, it, and it grabbed a little bit every once in a while. If you're moving to your left into the into the rotating line, you're, you're much more likely to get an evener cut. But that means you would have to start down here and go this way. Right, and then uh, because I'm right-handed, Jay brought up the point, like if I went like this, for me to go sideways and do this, look where my first is, like this is a normal walking pattern for me. So You're going frontwards, yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. If I like this, I'm not changing, but if I'm going like this, I have to switch hands, and I can do this, but because I'm right-handed, again, it's something I'm used to, and Jay's probably right. You know, a lot of that just takes practice, and I think a lot of times we do things that we're just more comfortable with or used to, but that's a good observation, and I didn't, you know, really think of it until you just mm. worked out some things. I'm sorry? Um... On, on, you mean on top of the sidewalk? Okay, on the other side. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. Want to show us? No, 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 really. 
No, no, because I'm not really, I'm not really following what you mean. So, so, I couldn't do shield, that if, with a shield adequately, but if you don't have a shield, then that brings up a whole bunch of other issues. But if you don't have a shield, you're right, you can easily do that. But again, if I'm coming through here like this, you know, it would be really difficult to do that with a shield because it's constantly, it won't let me get my angle in as well. You know, so like here right now, it would be tough. I'm sure it could be done, but I think it gets back to what I was saying earlier. A lot of times we do things we're just used to. 